everyone. So thanks for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Vivian Tran, and I'm an admissions and recruitment manager at the UBC Sauter School of Business. Before I begin tonight's um, event, I would like to acknowledge that UBC's Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places, um, near and far, and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. So thank you again for making the time to join us tonight for an important event to discuss um, an issue that's um, relevant to um, both the business world and, um, and, and society at general, which is why aren't there more women in leadership positions? And for us as a business school, why aren't there more women in um, MBA programs? So I thought to start the night off, I'd start with a bit of a fun activity. Oh, so it looks like my screen share has paused. So just give me a second to restart our presentation. Okay, so on to the activity that I mentioned. So what I wanna do is I'll show you a few pictures and, and talk about some of these women. So does anybody know who this might be? So you can kind of put your answers on the chat box on your guesses, um, if you know who this is, or um, you, know, you might wanna take a guess. Uh, so you can answer that in the chat box. So this is in fact, um, the president of Taiwan, Zai Ing Wen, and under her leadership, uh, during this COVID crisis, um, Taiwan has um, minimized infections to only 443 total infections and minimized death to only seven deaths. Can anyone guess who this one is? This one's a bit more of a, an easy one. Um, and this one is Jacinda Ardern, um, Prime Minister of New Zealand. And under her leadership, um, New Zealand has basically um, and hopefully eradicated COVID-19 from um, its country. And under her leadership, uh, the country was, um, was able to mitigate infections to only 1,500 total infections and 22 deaths. I think everyone who's from BC would know who this is. Um, this is our very own Dr. Bonnie Henry, who is the Chief Health Officer of British Columbia. And under her leadership, um, British Columbia was able to um, mitigate um, infections to 2,500 um, total infections um, versus a national total of 91,000 total infections nationally. So these are all examples of women leaders who have excelled in um, helping the world navigate a truly devastating crisis that has touched everyone in the world. And they aren't the only ones. Um, Women leaders the world over have proven that not only are women extremely effective leaders, but in some cases, they may actually be the best leaders. So for this evening, um, we wanna of course talk about the question of why aren't there more, more women leaders like this in the world? Why are women so underrepresented in leadership positions? And also as a business school, discuss with you, why aren't there more women in these MBA programs? And how we intend to do this is to bring you in contact, get you in contact with some of the women that have made this transition, that have invested in themselves um, in, in doing an MBA program and navigated both balancing, um, you know, a very demanding career along with their educational ambitions, as well as, um, you know, uh, also finding time to reach for their ambitions as well. So I hope if there's anything that you can get out of this evening watching this um, webinar tonight is that you see yourself in some of these women and that if you ever thought to yourself that I have so much on my plate already, I have young children, I have a demanding job, I don't have any time, that when you see these women's stories that are on our panel tonight, that you can see yourself in them and that you can believe that this is, can also be you as well. Um, so I hope that if there's anything you could take away from tonight is that you can see yourself in some of these women's become inspired by their stories and also take the first steps into investing in yourself as well. 
So the agenda for tonight, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our part-time professional MBA program, which is the program that many of the women on our panel have done. And then we're going to go on into our interactive MBA women's panel. Um, and I'll leave some time for some general questions towards the end. Um, now, do feel free um, throughout the course of the evening um, to ask questions to our team using the in-meeting in Q&A chat throughout the course of the webinar. Different team members representing recruitment admissions and the student experience team are also available to help answer specific questions. So I want to introduce um, the team members that we have here with us today. We have uh, Rebecca Bouchard, who is the, uh, an agility um, business partner um, with the BCLC, and she is a graduate of the part-time MBA program. We have Sarah Busey, who is the director of experiential learning and academic services with the UBC Faculty of Applied Science. Um, we have Tamara Isaac, who is a director of um, finance and business at Easter Seals BC and UConn, and she's a current PMBA student. And we have Martina Vakovakova, who is is the Assistant Dean of um, the Sauter Business Career Center and also um, a graduate of the full-time MBA program herself. Um, on admissions and recruitment, um, we also um, have my colleague Natalie answering questions on um, the uh, chat uh, Q&A. And the student experience team, we have uh, Donna, who is um, going to be answering questions as well in the Q&A. And we have a very special guest, I saw her earlier um, pop up, um, but we have our Assistant Dean, um, Teresa Pan, who's also joining us and she will also be answering questions. Um, on the chat box Q&A. So a full um, jam-packed event, like we're going to show you some profiles. We hope you get inspired by some of these profiles and we have um, team members here to answer any questions that you have as well. So let's talk about our professional MBA program. So like I mentioned before, this is the program that many of our women panelists that we're going to be meeting tonight have done. So this program is really about um, that on the premise of career um, organic career growth. So it's a program that allows students to continue working in their jobs while kind of reaching for um, organic career development as they go through the program. So how it works is the classes are just on the weekends only. So it's consistent with the full time work schedule. And so you do your classes on the weekends and then come Monday morning you can immediately basically use your own workplace as a living laboratory for you to apply new ideas bring new value added and basically prove yourself ready for that next promotion in um, in your career so um, this program has a tremendous track record of promoting that kind of career growth with 90% of our students typically getting at least one career promotion or advancement during the um, 24 months of the program with about one third of them actually getting double promotions so um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about what makes this program um, valuable and an and interesting consideration for those of you that want to move ahead in your career. So a little bit about who we are and, and where we stand in the world. So um, we are, for those of you that are from a, a you know, Vancouver um, geography, you'll know, you probably know this about our school already, but it is a very well-known school, not only in Canada, but also around the world. Um, the Sauter Business School is one of the top 45 global elite as ranked by the QS Global Business School rankings. We are number one in Canada for business um, and economics, and we have 40,000 alumni in 80 countries around the world. And those 40,000 alumni are just the Sauter Business School alumni. Um, but uh, the, U the larger UBC network is about 300,000 alumni in 140 countries around the world. So when you consider doing MBA and you're from a local, maybe Vancouver or lower mainland um, geography, obviously there's a lot of local programs you might be considering, but I would say UBC um, would stand ha head and shoulders in terms of giving you a program with a tremendous local representation but and, and um, connections and um, strategic alliances, but also a program that has a tremendous global reputation as well. So why not have both? Why not have um, a program that gives you both the local connection as well as the global connections because you never know where your career will take you in the world. So how does the program work? Um, so it's a 24 month program and the classes typically happen um, on an eight week cycles on the weekends only. So you can see here on this slide um, that typically you do one class on the Saturday and another class on the Sunday, and then there's a break, classes, break, classes, and then two weeks break. And then you would be doing um, your exam um, through online proctoring on the eighth week. And then the next eight weeks, we'll be looking at the next um, uh, two classes. So that's generally how the program classes work. Um, so you can see from the schedule, even though the classes are on the weekends, it's not every weekend. It's approximately once or twice a month, you'll have a weekend of classes. So it is very much um, you know, consistent with allowing you to still have a life, to still do weekend activities, but also get a, a dive in when you are in your classes on the weekends. 
Um, another hallmark feature of um, this program is, you know, alongside of our global reputation are opportunities for global experiences in the PMBA program. So one of such experiences is through our partnership with Yale University um, in the Global Network of Advanced Management. And um, this network contains 30 of the top business schools around the world, including schools like Yale, Berkeley, HSA, Oxford. And it offers our students in um, March and October of um, every year to do something called the Global Network. Work week. So these are kind of immersive week-long learning experiences. You can either do them at the partner institution or there's also opportunities to do these courses in small network online courses as well. So for those of you that can't travel, that um, don't have the ability to take that time off, you can also do these courses as um, online courses as well. And all of these courses, whether they are in person at the partner institution or online, will be credited back towards um, your MBA's elective credits. Um, some examples of global network weeks that we've had, so we can see some examples from last year. Um, they, you can see that they often have a regional or institutional bent to them. Um, so you can see that Berkeley did one last year on Bay Area Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Yale ran one on Behavioral Science of Management, and UBC ran its own network week on the Sustainable Development Goals, Cities, and Inclusive Prosperity. Um, in addition to our Global Network Week um, opportunities, of course, all these international options are optional because we know that you are working full time when you're doing the part time program. So it's no obligation to do them, but they are opportunities that you can undertake. Now, our exchange, summer exchange program is something that you're probably um, more familiar with if you did exchange in your undergrad. Um, so that's when you actually go abroad for like a semester or something shorter, like we have um, exchange programs that are as short as two to three weeks. So depending on your schedule, you can go for as short as, as long as you want. And we have 34 exchange partners all around the world. Basically all continents are covered except for Antarctica. So if you do wanna see those penguins, it'd probably be another program. But, um, but yeah, so we do have um, exchange partners on six continents. So um, here are some examples. Um, Copenhagen Business School is one of our partners. ESSIC in um, Paris is another one of our partners. But we also have exchange partners in Asia, South America, um, the United States, um, Oceania, and Africa as well. So anywhere you want to go, likely we'd be able to take you there through this program. So experiential learning is a major cornerstone of the PMBA program. So that's the idea of learning by doing. And, you know, there's a case-based kind of um, learning methodology that we employ in the, pro in the program. So as you're learning new concepts, you're learning how to apply them to solving actual business cases. And another element that is unique to our PMBA program are these three eight-day intensive residencies that we do in the beginning, middle, and end of the PMBA program. So you can see the professional residencies on this program journey happen in the first January, the next January, January and then the last December of your program. So basically beginning, middle and end. And um, they serve a pedagogical purpose, which is allowing our part-time students to actually get an immersive um, MBA experience in three strategic parts of your program. But it also serves another purpose in terms of bringing the MBA cohort together. So those of you that have done some research into what you can get out of an MBA program, what is the value proposition, you'll read that one of the major value propositions that you get from an MBA program is the network itself. So our MBA program is very, our PMBA program is very small. It's about 50 to 60 um, students, extraordinary individuals from all walks of life in different industries. And it's, it's really magical how they come together and they support each other. And um, not only professionally, but socially and academically as well, get going through the uh, 24 months of the program. So having these residency periods and three strategic points of the program allows these connections to build kind of early and maintain throughout the course of the program so that our students are constantly collaborating and um, and uh, helping each other as they go through this um, program. So uh, the purpose of these residencies are not just pedagogical, but to, to bring the cohort together as a supportive unit as well. So you can see that the journey, this is the first year of the journey you're seeing here on the screen. Um, the first year of the journey will be primarily um, business fundamental courses. So your um, um, management basics and statistics, um, accounting, finance, marketing, and then you'll be on to the next year of the program where you can see you're doing more advanced modules and they're all laid out here. Now, the second year of the program is also the opportunity for you to kind of swap out some of these um, advanced module courses for, um, you know, courses with the full-time MBA cohort, for example, or even courses outside of the Sauter Business School. So up to one third of your degree can actually be done outside of the Sauter Business School. And that is another advantage of selecting a world-class school like UBC is that there's a huge innovative research community that we're attached to that it's not just the business school so um, you know if there was um, 
you know, a, a course in computer science, like let's say you're a computer science major and there was a course on AI with the Department of Computer Science that um, you think would really benefit you, like if you get the permission to take that course from the instructor as well as the approval of their academic director, you can take that course and have that counted as elective credits towards your MBA. Similarly, if there was a course in the Faculty of Law that, you know, you have the permission to take that course from that course instructor and approval from your direct, uh, academic director, you can also have that, take that course and have that credited towards your MBA as well. So in terms of um, solder kind of elective courses, um, the more popular courses we try to schedule in the evenings so it maximizes the opportunities for our um, part-time students to take such as our tech entrepreneurship class but if you have some flexibility with your schedule you can even take some courses during the day with a full-time MBA cohort as well. Now you can see throughout the course of this MBA journey, um, career and professional development plays an integral part of what you're gonna get from the program. So there is a really strong focus on an individualized kind of career development plan for each of our MBA students, because you're all different, you're all coming from different backgrounds and you all have different goals. So um, that runs throughout the course of your MBA journey, but it also is a support system that is there for you for the rest of your career. So, you know, in 10 years down the road, if you wanna make that move to London, or if you wanted to make that move to Toronto, you can come back to the Business Career Center and get that support you need to get started in a, in a new market or get market insights on an industry, for example, and make a new connection. So I think that is an incredibly valuable um, part of our value proposition to you as an MBA student is that the journey doesn't end with the MBA program, doesn't end with graduation. The support continues for the rest of your career and that's truly something really remarkable. And you can also see that throughout the course of the program, there are um, proper breaks <laughs> scheduled in so that you do have a proper August break and you do get a break in the first December as well. And then another proper August break in the second year of your program. And then, um, and then, then you graduate. So um, that's basically how the program works. You can see in the second year of the program is also the opportunity to go on summer study abroad or GNAM network weeks if you're able to make the time for it as well. So like I said, personalized career coaching is a really important part of this program. In the program, you'll be matched with a, 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 career, a professional career coach that you'll work with one-on-one -on -one to kind of discuss what your specific objectives are. And, you know, they help you make strategic connections. You know, they pair you up with mentorship programs. Um, and, you know, they're basically a, a source of support and advice as you go through various stages of, um, you know, your career development from, you know, initializing discussions about where you want to go next to actually coaching you through um, various interview processes or you know they could be different depending on the company that you are applying to and they have a lot of insights into those things so another very strategic and important support system that you would have um, during your time as a PMBA student you can see here some of the career outcomes from our program. Um, you can see, like I said, that earlier statistic, 90% of our students will get at least one career promotion or advancement during the 24 months of the program. And like I said, about one third of them actually get double promotions during the program. Now, career outcomes fall into two broad categories. One would be career changers. So people that, um, these are people that are generally changing not only job types, but they're often changing um, industries and, and companies as well. So you can see someone who was a junior project engineer at an engineering consulting company ended up doing a complete shift to working as an associate with a top tier management consulting company at McKinsey post um, MBA. Um, and you can see someone who was um, a registered nurse and project manager at a hospital. So a very kind of like um, hands on operational role became a managing director in a healthcare related um, company after she graduated. So those are some examples of career changers and then career promoters. And so you might, you might identify with one category or the other and career promoters are people that are often working in a company where they can see a potential for growth and they like the company um, and they see opportunity for growth. So career promoters are people that promote within the company. So you can see someone who was a logistics manager at the beginning of the um, PMBA program became a regional manager of terminal operations at BC Ferries. So same company, but much more strategic and leadership role and um, you can see someone else who was working as a manager of power utilities at an asset management company so much more segmented role they took on a much broader role post MBA as v VP of asset management at the same firm post MBA so these are the type um, of career changes that um, students get um, from doing this PMBA program and I want to put a um, I want to talk a little bit first about our um, fellow candidates so what um, who your fellow candidates are so you can see the class size um, it's roughly about 50 to 60 last year we had our largest class ever so it was 62 
Um, but you can expect like somewhere between 50 to 60 people in your class um, with approximately seven to eight years working experience on average, average age is mid thirties. But I want to take a point here to, um, to say that there's no right, real right age to do the MBA. You can see last year's class had a range, right? Anywhere from 27 to 52. So, um, I, cause I often get the question from people like, am I too old? Am I too young? The correct answer really is like, you're the right age to do the MBA when you are ready to benefit from this program. So you could be 27 and maybe working, let's say as an engineer in a very operational role and you want to move up, but you don't have the strategic um, business education to kind of start moving up into those um, uh, business related roles or leadership related roles. So that's when, and you're ready for that shift, then the MBA can be ready for, that could be your choice to do when you're 27. Or on the flip side of things, if you are 52 years old and you have moved into uh, the C-suite through your mastery of your um, you know, um, technical domain of expertise, and now you find yourself in this leadership position, but no formal um, business training, then the MBA can be right for you at that point in your life because you actually need to know how to manage things, how to manage an enterprise, for example. So then for that person, 52 was the right age to do the MBA. So anywhere in between is, is right as well. It's really when you are ready to do the MBA and when you are ready to benefit from it. You can see that we have all ranges of undergraduate majors. I often do get the question of like, it's like I'm an arts graduate, is this MBA right for me? Um, the answer is yes. I'm gonna show you some profiles later on of some people that are from majors that you don't necessarily expect to do an MBA, but have flourished in their careers by doing this MBA. So you can see they do come from different undergraduate majors. There's no preference for one or the other. Um, again, it's really about fit and readiness. Um, work experience by industry. So sometimes I also get questions about like, I'm working in like a nonprofit or I'm working in entertainment. Like, is the MBA right for me? Like, I want to get business experience to move up into like leadership positions, but you know, like is an MBA really for someone in like a nonprofit or a, an entertainment or, or something that you would consider like um, non-business? And the answer again is yes. You know, if you get a paycheck, then your business is business related. And also, like, if you think about it, if you're from an industry where everybody thinks that like an MBA is not their thing, most likely that industry is the one that really needs someone with an MBA. So you can really set yourself apart by doing one and bringing those skills to that industry that's probably sorely lacking. So I want to take this moment now to kind of put the faces, um, like faces to these stories that I've been telling you and, and show you some profiles of women that have, that have done the PMBA program and, and how they've advanced in their careers. So the first person I want to feature is um, Jiamei, who is currently working as a uh, associate partner with McKinsey and you can see that in her educational background she is an engineer by training like bachelor and master's degree in engineering and she also did the MBA with us around 2012 2000, 2011 2012 and you can see at the beginning of her MBA journey she was working in a more operational role with the city of Vancouver and then she ended up transitioning to much more leadership and strategy role as a senior consultant of business um, transformation at Van City um, during the program um, then you can see that she moved on to become a director of business transformation at Tree Industries, um, Tree Island Industries, and then eventually moving into the consulting world uh, where she has rapidly um, moved up the, the, the ladder there. So that's an example of one um, MBA from an engineering background. The second one I want to showcase is Katerina, and Katerina is from an arts background. So for any of those of you that are from like arts or non-business backgrounds or non-quantitative backgrounds, you're wondering whether this is for you, take a look at her profile. She did a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and graduated in 2006, did her MBA with us in 2010 to 2012. And you can see pre-MBA, she was working as a manager with um, the BC government. And um, when she finished the MBA, she was able to make a shift into a really business oriented, like, like finance um, field with working as a director of technology and innovation with BMO Financial Group. And it is now working um, with a venture capital firm as a director. So um, like these tremendous changes are possible. So if, if you've ever wondered if you can make that kind of shift, this is an example here for you. Um, Shadi is another um, engineer by training. You can see that she also has a bachelor and master's degree in engineering. Um, and you can see she did her MBA with us from 2014 to 2017. And you can see when she started the MBA with us, she was working as a, an engineer basically with um, Ballard Power Systems. And then post MBA, she was able to make that shift into a strategic um, strategy consulting uh, position with uh, Deloitte. So a, a real dramatic shift there. You can see a clear shift from a more operational technical role to a more strategy and leadership role post-MBA. 
Allison is a science graduate. Um, so you can see at the beginning of her MBA journey, she was working as a senior manager in the healthcare field. So she was managing a team, but she, she hadn't transitioned out of the healthcare field where she probably got an in because of her background. And then um, post MBA, she got an in, de uh, in degree change um, to work with uh, the British Columbia Utilities Commission as a senior regulatory analyst working on sustainability and Aboriginal um, engagement and continued moving up in this sector. And now is uh, working as a senior manager of regulatory affairs with Central One Credit Union. And finally, Alicia is um, another um, arts graduate. Uh, she graduated with a degree in communications English from SFU and did her degree with us from 2017 to 2019, so one of our younger grads. And you can see at the beginning of the program, she was um, working as a change management analyst um, with UBC actually. And then shortly after, about six months into her PMBA journey or part-time MBA journey, she got uh, in a program change to work as a change analyst with Lululemon and then now is working as a senior consultant of, um, at Deloitte. So again, that shift into a very business-oriented, strategy-oriented and leadership um, transition for Alicia. So I hope these um, kind of career profiles kind of speak to you that they, for any of you that ever wondered if it fit or if I wasn't the right fit, um, that you see yourself in some of these profiles and you can see um, what can be done with this program and you can identify with some of these journeys um, uh, because they are really are um, quite remarkable and it really speaks to what can happen when you take a chance and invest in yourself. So now I want to go on to talk a little bit about admission requirements. I want to wrap it up um, so that we can get to our panel, but let's talk a little bit about mission requirements to the PMBA program first. So we are looking for an um, undergraduate degree with an academic achievement of about B plus or a 76% average. Now, if you are like kind of below or you did terribly in your first year, first of all, like if you did terribly in your first year, that's like 80% of the people that we see. So don't worry about that. Um, but we do know like if you are under on the, um, the, your G undergrad GPA um, note A that we look primarily at the senior level courses, so third and fourth year. And then also like if you are kind of below, a good way to mitigate that is to do better on your standardized tests. So the standardized test requirement is either the GMAT or the GRE. So competitively, we're looking for a GMAT of 650 um, or a GRE of 320. Um, but on a minimum, we're looking for like a minimum 550 on the GMAT or 300 on the GRE. Now, anecdotally, I can tell you that kind of more quantitative or oriented individuals um, kind of do better on the GMAT, whereas more arts and social sciences individuals tend to excel better on the GRE. Now, this is just an anecdotal observation, so definitely check out both tests and see which one fits you best. Now, a rule of thumb, there's a lot of um, prep courses available for GMAT and GRE, and a good rule of thumb to, um, to know whether you need prep is if you look at the practice questions, and you notice you feel kind of out of depth, like you don't even know where to start with some of these questions, then that's probably a good indication that you should, that you should probably consider prep. Prep is good because it's usually in a defined amount of time. For example, um, we have UBC continuing studies which offer GMAT and GRE prep, and their courses are typically on a nine week cycle and coincide with a test date. So it gives you kind of a running start to kind of get into the actual testing stage. And it gives you a structured learning environment, like some of this, some of these questions you can kind of bang your head over a long period of time and you can develop bad habits and you don't want to do that because these tests are kind of time sensitive so you do want to develop um, good habits when you're approaching these tests so consider prep if you feel like you know if you feel like kind of out of depth when you're looking at the questions Professional experience, we're looking for a minimum of two years, but for the PMB program, ideally it's three to five. If you are just at two years of work experience and you feel strongly about doing the PMB program, please do get in touch with us. We'd probably want to take a look at your profile and see really whether it's the time for you to benefit from this program. So it's, um, we've definitely had people with just two years of work experience, but it's definitely a case by case basis where we want to see that whether this really is the right time for you to do the MBA. Um, minimum of two professional references, so that is ideally someone, uh, one person that you've uh, reported to directly, and then another person could be someone that knows you well in a professional context. There's a variety of written and video essays that are involved with the process. Um, they're, very, they're really quite short, so you do want to make sure that you're answering the question. And for the written answer, a good rule of thumb to make sure you're answering the question correctly is to have someone that's never read the question read your essay and see if they can figure out what the question is. So that's like a nice rule of thumb to see, like, if you actually answered the question. 
question. Now, the, the 90 second video, um, you know, it doesn't have to be like a Steven Spielberg Oscar winning kind of video clip. Um, we're basically just looking for good content and, and just to see how you come across professionally. So um, good rule of thumb for that is just make sure you have good content, show you've thought about the question and, um, you know, appear the way you would want to appear in a job interview. So that's always a good rule of thumb as well. Don't have like a soccer game going on in the background and, sh and show how you are professionally. Um, English proficiency tests, either the IELTS or the TOEFL. IELTS, we're looking for an average of seven, and um, TOEFL, we're looking for 100. And this test is waived if you did your first degree in English, so that's probably going to be most of you. Um, if you have any questions about this English proficiency testing requirement, just feel free to reach out to us if you feel like, you know, like, is this really necessary or like, because I've been working here for 10 years, um, and we can always talk about that. Um, personal interview. Um, so this is a 30 to 45 minute interview that happens towards the end of the process. And right now they're all, of course, being done by video. Um, but once things open up again and it's allowed, um, they can also take place in person at UBC Solder. So I want to talk a little bit about our application rounds. Um, you can see there's three rounds of um, deadlines. The first deadline has just passed. So we're looking now at the second round deadline, which is July 21st. And you can see that there's a small scholarship incentive associated with the second round, which is $1,000 off of your tuition if you do apply, you know, a a submit a complete application, including test scores and, and compositions and everything like that by July 21st. Um, so that's something that you might want to aim for, but you do have all the way until um, October 13th to submit an application. Although given the, the demand for this program that we saw last year, I would recommend trying to like not apply like right at the final deadline if you can make it, um, just because we do admit on something called a rolling basis. So what that means is that let's say we, we don't hold applications till that deadline to start assessing. We actually start assessing and rendering decisions as soon as we um, uh, receive a completed application. So if you apply by July 4th, you're going to get a decision before someone that applies by July 21st, for example. Um, so never rush an application. Always submit with your strongest application possible. But, um, you know, try to apply early if you're able to. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is this um, tuition fee, it's particularly the domestic tuition fee, because I often get a lot of questions about it. So for those of you that have done some research into how much top tier MBA programs cost, I often get the question of how come your price is like half the price of like a Rotman or a McGill or an Ivy. And the, the reason for that is because of our lovely location here in the province of British Columbia. Um, there's a provincial revenue cap on how much we can charge for domestic tuition. So you are getting a top tier education for half the price. Now, I'm not trying to downplay that this, this isn't a lot of money. This is still a lot of money, but it's definitely easier to handle 49000 than 100000 and And the amount is divided into six installments paid out over the 24 months of the program as well. So this is all my contact information. Um, like I said before, we welcome your inquiries. Uh, if you're really, if you're considering this program or you're even like cursorily interested to see if this program is the right fit for you, please get in contact with us. You should never take the decision to do such a program without having a proper discussion with us about what this program means for you and what, um, what it can do for you. So it's a big investment of your time and money. So we recognize that and we encourage you to get in contact with us. My email is there and you can also um, self book a one-on-one -on -one advising session with me um, anytime through my booking link here. And we will be forwarding this information, this contact information and booking link in a follow-up email after this event. So um, we're going to save questions till the end, but um, I'm going to invite um, our panelists now to um, join us for the women's panel um, portion of the event. Um, so if you can, uh, our panelists can please turn on their, um, their video feeds. I'll stop share here so we can see everyone. Okay, great. So it looks like we have everyone here. So thank you so much um, for, for joining us tonight and for sharing your remarkable stories. Um, so I hope everyone becomes inspired because I certainly am inspired when I, because I know your stories um, and, and then that, that our audience can see themselves in you. Um, so why don't we just start off with some rounds of introductions, um, talk about um, you know who you are, um, what you're doing bef um, for the MBA, or maybe start with who you are when you graduated or if you're still studying, and then what you were doing before the MBA and what you were doing now. And everybody is currently mute right now, just so everyone knows. Uh, maybe we'll start with um, Sarah. I want to start with Sarah, actually, because I want to also give Sarah a congratulations because she was recently promoted to a director um, at uh, the Faculty of Applied Science. So that I want to start with um, Sarah first because she was the last one that got a promotion. 
Oh, thanks, Vivian. <laughs> Um, so, hi everyone, my name is Sarah Busey um, and I graduated from the part-time MBA program in 2015 and uh, Rebecca, who is one of the other panelists, and I were actually cohort members, which is a really important part of the program. Um, before the MBA, I was actually working as a geologist. I used to run scientific um, geology programs doing bedrock mapping and all sorts of other things up in the far north. Uh, and post MBA, I did a lot of different things. Um, I got the opportunity to try um, working for a tech startup. Um, I worked for stem cell for a year. Uh, and then the wonderful Martina, um, who was on this call, gave me my first opportunity in post-secondary, working as the Associate Director of Student Experience and Career on a one-year um, mat leave fill. And uh, through that experience, I discovered how much I work, love working for post-secondary. Um, after that, I moved to take over um, to the experiential learning portfolio in applied science. And just recently, I was promoted to take over um, three units within applied science, um, all of the cooperative education, student development, and academic services. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Sarah, and your progression. Um, so who's next? Who wants to go next? Or I'm just going to pick. <laughs> um, well, we'll go Rebecca. Hi, I'm happy to go next. So um, yes, I'm Rebecca Bouchard. Um, also graduated in 2015, which is five years ago now, which seems like a lifetime. Uh, so I started the MBA in 2013. Um, I was currently working as uh, basically doing events for a law firm. Um, I was also seven months pregnant when I started, and um, which was a lot of fun and uncomfortable. Um, and Throughout the program, um, when I went back to work after my mat leave, um, I transitioned to a business development role, um, took on an acting director role at the law firm before I moved. The day after the program finished, um, started at BC Lotteries in our um, social responsibility division, but I'm currently an agility business partner working um, with our people and culture and enterprise team on um, how we can work better together. And um, yeah, I would say that not just the learning from the MBA, but to Sarah's point, like we still get together every month, if not more than once. We were supposed to be together <laughs> last last weekend for our annual trip that got canceled due to COVID. And I think we're all very sad, but yeah, so that, that's pretty much my story. Great, thank you so much for sharing. And like also like your stories always inspired me knowing that you like started the program like about to have a baby, which is like another <laughs> another person's story here as well. But that always impressed me when when I hear these stories of how you managed all of that. So thank you for sharing. Um, so why don't we go to Tamara next? Um, because uh, Tamara also has a really remarkable story as well, and she's uh, a current PMB student. Hi. Yes. Yeah, so I'm in my second year uh, as a PMBA student. So I'm about a year and a half in. Um, before my program, I was the controller at Easter Seals, which is a, a financial accounting role. I'm, a, I'm an accountant by trade. Um, and I started the program with a four month old baby. So not pregnant, but, but with a little baby. <laughs> and uh, I remember throughout the whole application process, you were like growing with your baby. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is, this is definitely a special woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might not know this, Vivian, but I actually received the acceptance letter in the hospital <laughs> that I had delivered. <laughs> that's amazing. So, so that was um, kind of a funny memory. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. And like you, you ended up getting a career promotion during the program as well. Into yes. your career role. So I was on maternity leave when I started the program and um, my organization was very keen to bring me back. So they offered me a promotion to, to get me back a little bit early with the PMBA. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was promoted a year later. So my promotion was to director of finance and I took over their real estate strategy. Um, and a year later I was director of finance and business. So now I do all risk assessment you know, responding to COVID <laughs> and, uh, and, that, and that kind of stuff. So it's been a lot of fun. And um, definitely the PMBA has been a big reason for pushing my employers to give me more. Very incredible. Like I just, like you had a baby and you got a promotion during the mat leave and then another potion. And ladies, 
<laughs> this woman hasn't even finished her MBA yet. So like, who knows what else is to come for um, tomorrow. So that's really amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so Martina is next. And um, so Martina plays a very special role because she is the assistant dean of the Business Career Center. So talk about your um, kind of MBA journey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I hope that my technology is going to actually last. I've been having some Wi-Fi issues today. So um, my apologies if I have to turn the video off for a, a better sound. Um, if I can, if I can, first thing, congrats, Sarah. Um, this is absolutely amazing. I'm so proud of you. Um, this is just kind of for all of the attendees to see how tight the, the community is and you know, people knowing each other and giving each other's opportunities. I think that that's one of the really great things that I love about Sorter um, and the MBA. So I am a um, grad of the full-time MBA. However, I know the journey of a part-timer quite well because actually I did my previous master's degree in econ as a part-timer and my bachelor's as well. So I basically had no weekends for five years and, and I never want to experience that again. And that's why I actually chose the full-time MBA. It was, it was quite the journey. Um, my career actually was quite um, varied before I came to do my MBA. Um, I started in international relations. Um, I worked on an IPO for an airline. I ran an agency for small and medium sized enterprises with a venture capital fund. Um, and then when I came to my MBA at Sauter, I was certainly not planning to work in education. This was a big surprise for me. Um, but I think that Sauter actually played a huge role for me to choose to work in education. And I haven't regretted that um, um, ever. Um, I think that it was one of the best things I've ever done. And um, I actually came to the MBA program quite experienced. I think I had about 12 years of experience. So I was one of the, you know, let's call it more mature in my program rather than older. Um, and um, yeah, I started actually um, to work in UBC straight after my MBA with the development and online engagement. And then I moved um, to BCC about uh, three years after. And I have to say that my job right now, and I'm so glad to see some of the stories that you shared with Vivienne, because um, I, I have to say that this job is not just a job, it's more of a mission um, or a purpose. It took me about 18 years to get here, but I'm loving every minute of it. Even though in COVID crisis, it can be, uh, you know, your intellectual stimulation definitely gets a kick. So, um, but it's, um, I'm, I'm having a great time and I'm actually very, grateful for, um, for that opportunity to solve. Great. I, I think we're you finished. Sorry, you like paused just towards the end there. So um, I think we caught everything. But thank you so much for sharing that and, and just for sharing like, yeah, that it is a close knit community. Like we're always excited to see what our grads do and they remain connected with us and, and still draw on, on our services sometimes. So um, that's, that's a really lo lovely thing to share. Um, now, I just want to put it out to our attendees to like, please feel free to start ads, um, posing your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, I will be posing this to our panelists um, as, we, as we go through this panel, but I want to do a, a quick warm up question just because this is really quite unique um, because I think many of the, um, the women on this panel have also you know, managed children or even having babies like during the program. So I want to ask um, those of you that um, can share about that or just managing family in general as you are advancing in your career. Um, to, to give us some idea of like, um, you know, how you did it. And if you have any tips for people that really at this point, I'm certainly with this COVID crisis and children at home probably feel very overwhelmed. So like, what are your strategies? And like, what can you tell people that are feeling like it just can't be done? We can start again. Um, so I didn't say this in my first round, but I had two children while I did the MBA. Um, like Tamara, I started uh, when my uh, baby was still quite young and I was on maternity leave. So she was six months old. And then I got pregnant during, again, during the program um, and had my second one midway through. Uh, Rebecca and I were in classes uh, and I think I returned to class five days after delivering my second daughter um, and graduated holding both my, my daughters at the end with a one and a three-year-old. So it was, it was challenging, um, but I was very lucky to have other women who did this with me. So Rebecca was pregnant when she started. We also had another woman in our program as well who had um, a son and was on maternity leave as well. 
um, people were just really supportive. Um, you know, Rebecca and I were just joking before this that uh, like it was hard. It was really hard to manage family and people, but just like everything and schoolwork. Um, but I have to say that the the staff was really supportive from things like finding me a place to breastfeed during our breaks <laughs> um, and to, you know, just just understanding that women have different priorities and um, like we made it work and we, we, we got it done. Um, I also have a, an amazing partner who uh, saw this as, and I know Rebecca does as well, um, we talk about it frequently, but he was amazing in seeing this as a benefit to our family, both in the long term, but also um, for him like spending quality time with our children. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I would echo that. Um, I kind of saw it as an opportunity to test the waters for, you know, wanting to grow in my career and knowing that someday in my future, I would, you know, be hopefully in a more demanding role. So I wanted to see how that was going to work as a family um, while I was going through it. To be completely honest, it wasn't that, it, it's not true. It wasn't as difficult during my mat leave. Um, and, um, uh, in again, my partner was really great. Like he brought out my daughter to class so I could feed her during the day on those Saturdays when she was five weeks old, which was great. We didn't last very long, but um, this partner support, we don't have any family in Vancouver. Um, so it was a hundred percent just like my husband and I, um, but also I think that one of the big things too is, is having that um, support from your employer, not necessarily uh, financial support because you can always make back the money, but having the emotional support from your employer. Um, to be honest, I didn't because I, when I started the program, my goal was to have to do the program so that I could move on from where I was currently. Um, so I didn't bring them into the loop. But when I talked to other uh, friends of mine and, and kind of classmates, having that support from their employers to understand that, you know, after weekend of classes, is it okay if I come in at noon on Monday or, you know, I have to leave a bit early to get to class on Friday. And that I think is really, really beneficial. So if you're looking to stay within your company and looking to grow within your company, really get them on board to see the benefit of it, because that will help you to manage, um, manage your time and, and juggle all of that. Wonderful. Yeah, having supportive employers makes a world of difference if you can find it. Not everyone's going to have that. Um, but, you know, getting, you know, if your employer's on board, you know, you can pitch the value proposition, like certainly for Tamara, like, it's obviously they value um, what she's bringing and what she's learning. So if, if those of you that are in us, in, lucky enough to have a supportive employer, that's a really good thing to pitch, you know, why you want to do this MBA. And you can even pitch like maybe there's like some funding available. Obviously, it's quite scarce these days due to COVID, but you never know until you ask, or at least you can get their moral support or understanding for if you have those tough weeks at school um, when there's exams and projects due. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in um, and also echo the um, support of an employer. I think when I was going through my application process, my C the CEO was really apprehensive about me taking this on and what that would mean for her um, if I could handle it all. And, you know, CEOs only have a three to five year term on average. And so I did see a transition in CEO and um, all of the CEOs came around and showed their support. One CEO had no children in her past, but had had a successful career, but still was able to um, make space for me to, to have the flexibility that I needed. And I think what they saw is that I showed up when I didn't have to, and I showed up more when I was there um, because of that confidence they gave me. Um, but yeah, going further about network and um, finding champions, uh, my my partner is very supportive of of me, and um, and so is my extended family network. We have we actually have an abundance of family close by. <laughs> we have too much family <laughs> close by, um, and so we have some key champions like my parents and Carl's parents who who see this as something they support and they're behind and they help out all the time and Carl helps out my husband helps out all the time um and I have three children so and, and my third was the one I had when I started the program what um but what I find 
Like, so it's getting those champions and the support, but I find adding a course is not like adding an extra day of work. Um, it gives you energy, it's rejuvenating, it kind of expands your mind and you're doing it with a group of colleagues. So I guess I would challenge people who are considering about it, about this, to think about it differently. Don't think about it as an additional eight hours, but think about it maybe as your personal you time where you rejuvenate and you expand your mind and you can kind of, like I just find when I, I had to take a two month break when COVID started because um, not just for family, family was part of that, also work. I was working 12 hour days at that time uh, in response to what was happening. And um, I found I was so drained and I just popped into a course um, now because it's all virtual, you can do that. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, right, this is balance. And this is about getting energy from something and learning and growing. So I guess if you were thinking about, oh, it might be too much, don't think about it in terms of hours of the day, think about it in terms of balance and what gives you energy. So I heard a rumor tomorrow that you actually found reprieve <laughs> from your uh, from your family obligations in the classes is that like is that true like you actually felt a little more relaxed when you're going into the classes it was so lovely <laughs> so especially yeah. now that I have three children at home because the two older ones are home from school um a time when it's just you sitting and focusing on something I mean that's meditative in and of itself because right now I might have to do a report or a financial something for work and I have children popping in talking to me about their homework or my baby's crying or you know and that that kind of wears on you the constant asking for things <laughs> and not because but I want to do it I love them um, but certainly a mind can only take so much and I find the coursework to be um, you know, a focused time and it kind of brings me back to center. That's amazing. So it's that like kind of your time to invest in yourself despite yeah. all the different obligations that you have going on. Yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. And Martina, um, do you have anything add, to add to this discussion about like finding that balance? Um, you've seen many people go through this and, you know, like what, what do you have to add to, um, to finding success in these types of environments? Yeah, well, one thing I will say, because I've got um, a team full of working moms and, and Tamara, I have to say that some of them are telling me that they would love to come back to the office um, and, you know, and, and work again in, in the office rather than at home. Um, and, you know, the, the one thing I would like to add is um, I'm, I'm, I'm coming from a bit of a different perspective. Moms have, um, I have a huge respect for moms um, because I helped to raise three younger siblings and I was a nanny, believe it or not, for three years, actually, in England um, when I was 18 to 21. Um, and I've always played with the question, am I going to have a family? Am I going to have children? And for me, um, it was a really important question. And, and there was a lot of family pressure on, on having children. But I actually decided the best thing for me is not to have children. But it, it is remarkable when you are leaders out there in the community and, you know, um, the MBA program is one thing, but for example, one of the things that a lot of us struggle with is you can go to a networking event and they'll be asking you, you know, why don't you have children or do you have any children? And that's something that a lot of people lead with, which might have nothing to do with your career. So, you know, it's um, both these angles can be quite, um, you know, sensitive. That can be a sensitive talk to me about this. You know, I don't want to have a family. If, you know, if somebody's going to ask me, how do I explain it from a professional perspective and, and so on and so on. So I've been doing a lot of conversations, both with undergrads, MBAs um, uh, around this topic, because, you know, some women would love to have a family and, and they want to know how to position themselves out there. And some women, you know, want to, um, to talk about how do I explain to people that I don't want to have a family. So both of those topics can be quite, um, quite difficult. Um, so I'm, I'm one of those who decided not to have children. And um, sometimes those conversations are not any easier. So maybe that's something to add to the conversation. Yeah, that's a really important point to make as well. Everyone's coming from different family environments and, and different choices. It's really like not anyone's business. It's a challenge that people like go through. Um, and, you know, like 
it's it's unfortunate like it's still an issue <laughs> but um you know that like people would ask these questions and somehow it can bias um people like against you or you worry about it um so I, i'm really glad you brought that up martina because that is um really something that we that we still struggle with i mean as women um this this idea that you know like we are burdened with the biological burden of whether you choose or choose to have children or not. And that has great impacts on your career. If you do choose to have children, you take a break in your career. And how is that perceived, um, you know, as you try to move up? And so, um, you know, I don't have the right answers. We're still evolving, I think, a society to um, move to a better place in that regard. And I'm just so pleased when I see that, um, you know, despite all these societal challenges that the, the, the mentality hasn't evolved to the right place yet, that, um, women in our program are still finding this level of success despite these types of challenges. Great, so I'm gonna move on to some questions from our, um, from our participants. So um, right off the bat, we have a question for Tamara from Harneel. Um, and they're asking, how was your experience in the PMBA program going from a normal in-person, um, in-class setting to the new normal during the uh, COVID situation slash pandemic? That's a timely question. <laughs> um, you know, I, when the pandemic hit, or when it became important, was kind of March 15th. So I wrote my final exam in the course that I was in, I believe it was March 29th or 30th. So I think our whole class at that time was just like, let's just write this exam and get things done because our workplaces were exploding. Um, and they needed us. Um, so I finished that course and I had to make a decision really quickly to pull out because my two older children were not um, in school anymore. So they were home full time. And I wanted to be sure that they transitioned emotionally in that. I didn't know how they would process a global pandemic um, <laughs> and what that might mean for their, their health and um and education which you know kids are so beautiful and young and they can they can learn later i'm not too concerned to have about them in the long run um so i my first experience in the online environment was with a shanghai international imba program so i was able to join this class because of the virtual environment and i attended entrepreneurial finance with richard mckellar um, he's a partner at a venture capital firm in Vancouver called Chrysalix. Um, and it was just such a lovely experience. The structure of the course was four hours on Friday night, five to nine, four hours on Saturday, five to nine. Um, there was about two or three weeks of relatively intense as homework assignments. So we were submitting case reviews and financial analysis for two weeks going up to that. And then we did the Friday night. I had to do a group assignment via Zoom with some of my colleagues here in Vancouver, because we all hopped on um, Saturday morning. And then I attended the class Friday night. I heard there was a little bit of a mistake where we didn't get enough lecture hours. So we're doing a <laughs> bonus Friday night next week. <laughs> um, Richard McKellar, I think it's about how the professors make it exciting. Uh, Richard McKellar is a very professional presenter. Um, he's a leader in the field. He has lovely stories to share and that can really break it up. Um, he's also very um, ruthless with cold calling people. So you really need to like come prepared to answer any fact on the case that you read. <laughs> so that that a lot since it's all virtual. <laughs> Yeah, well, he he will call on you. You have to have your video on and then, yeah. So that was my only experience with the online program. Um, and it was wonderful and I had a great experience. Um, in two weeks, I will be attending a GNAM, which is a global network week at Berkeley on the issue of gender, um, gender and equity. So I'm really excited about that opportunity. I would not have had that opportunity otherwise because I couldn't take a week off work at that time to go to San Francisco. Um, so yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I think um, the online environment, I think the leadership at UBC is taking a good look at that and asking 
students how they feel about things. Um, I can say I've had positive experiences so far, but they've been limited. And I think by January of next year, if there's some kind of hybrid, there, there might be some learnings even to incorporate online more. Yeah, certainly it's just like a unexpected pilot program that we've all been put into <laughs> on a grand scale. So um, yeah. I'm sure there's gonna be some learnings from that. Thanks for sharing. Um, so let's go on to some other questions. Um, so this question looks like it's gonna be for all panelists. Um, so feel free for all of you to weigh in. Um, first, so this is from Haley. Um, firstly, sincerely impressed with all the panelists. Thank you for sharing your stories and evenings. Um, her question is, would love to hear from any or all of you one unexpected benefit from the um, part-time MBA or PMBA, something that you hadn't expected um, to be um, now such an important part of you. I can start this and I'll be just like be super cheesy with it. When I started, when I was looking at the part-time programs, I was really keen on doing a program that was based in the city that I wanted to stay in from a business networking perspective. So for me, you know, I had some friends who were looking at the program at Queens, which was um, virtual and, and even Royal Roads, but I really wanted to be based where I, because I was thinking about the business connections and the opportunities. I would say the thing that probably surprised me the most and um, caught me off guard was the, um, the, the strength of the friendships and support that I gained from the program. Um, and I mean, like Sarah, Sarah could, would probably say the same thing, like the, the group of people in our cohort and the way that we came together, when you're going through something like that together and like so intensely, you just spend so much time together and you get to know each other so well. And what's great is that when, you know, it's five years after we graduated, when one of us has a challenge that we're either dealing with a challenge at work or we're thinking about moving somewhere, or we're going through an interview process and trying to negotiate a new salary. We have this like network of people that we can go to who will just give us real talk. And, um, and that to me is a hundred percent for, for all of the academic stuff I learned, it was 100% worth it for that network of what I would say, like some of my closest friends now. Yeah, the, the cohort experience in this program is truly extraordinary, like how you support each other during the program and that you continue supporting each other after the program, like those real conversations um, that you can really have only with close friends, but they're also kind of like a strategic business network as well, which is super cool. Yeah, I wanted to add to that. I mean, uh, our cohort really is, I think, spectacular. Like half of us still get together monthly, which is um, a testament to just the friendships we have. Um, but I do, do also want to mention that the cohort is the same answer that I have for this question, but um, in particularly the women in our group. Um, every opportunity I've had post MBA is because of either people who have done the MBA in the past or people that I did the MBA with. Um, Martina is included in that. Um, uh, that as well. Um, last year, I sent an article around to the women in, in our MBA cohort about how um, they did some research around how important women colleagues are um, in females' success post MBA, and it really resonated with me um, just because of the opportunities I've had from other women who've done MBAs. So it's been, um, yeah, the cohort is just an incredible and very unsurprising for me as a geologist before um, that the power of it. Mm -hmm. Tamara or um, uh, Martina, anything you want to add about like a surprising thing that you've taken out of the program? I think um, something that I didn't uh, realize I should have valued as highly as it as it is is the um, business career center. So that's kind of your career coach, and I used it quite early in renegotiate or negotiating return to work. Um, and I just didn't even realize how bad I was at negotiating salary <laughs> So before that. Um, so, you know, Vivian remembers, cause I was really like, I asked a lot of questions about return on investment from the MBA early <laughs> on. And I sent lots of emails, like, can you just disclose what, you know, people are earning five years out? Just, you know, just let me know so I can do a return on investment. And, um, I realized, I think probably a career coach with the business career center could have helped me <laughs> well, like really fast. So, um, yeah, it's been lovely, um, having that support and being questioned and they're, they're, um, the team is really professional. Um, they're intelligent. 
and they're not pushy. So they kind of meet you where you're at. It's, it, it was a, a, a great takeaway and certainly it translated to set more salary and more flexibility for my life. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Hopefully those like successful career negotiations that you're like salary negotiations you're going to get will accumulate into like well covering the cost of your PMBA program. Yeah. And I should say they actually teach a course on salary negotiations later on, um, but I didn't have that then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. No, I'm so glad that you had that, that you had that benefit. Women do negotiate, negotiate less, but I wanted to actually share a funny story on the return on investment. Um, I did, um, you know, as I said, my, my MBA is a part, um, as a full timer, but we actually I think still hold a record for the number of weddings that happened in our cohort. I think that we had five people who got, you know, um, five, five couples who got married as a, as a, as a result of it. And I was recently actually, um, uh, checking in with one of my classmates and, and his wife who were part of my cohort. And, um, we were actually discussing what was the big, biggest benefit of the MBA. And, and he actually told me, Martina that I got to marry Patch, her name is Patch, was the biggest benefit I got. Like it was worth every penny of my MBA. Um, so those things can happen as well. But I would just like to, to add what Rebecca and Sarah said as well, is the friendships. And if actually some of you um, are international, as I was an international student, and are thinking of doing the PMBA, it is a fantastic thing. I mean, I think that the best entry to Canada is actually as an international student through education. Um, and, um, as, as they mentioned, the friends that you're going to gain are going to be your friends, I think forever. And, and it's really good to kind of like, they're almost like your family here in Vancouver, right? If you don't have your family here with you. So, um, that was definitely something that I didn't expect that we become so close. I expected the business network, but I didn't expect the, the family ties and, and such close friendships as well. But, um, yeah, there is marriages too. So there you go. Yeah, I guess the flip side of like not having like a, a ton of women like in P MBA programs is like suddenly you have all these choices, <laughs> with like all these like really great guys. So yeah, so there's been some like love matches in this program and like, who knows, you do an MBA, you get a life partner out of it too. Like who wouldn't want that? <laughs> Um, great. So, so thanks for sharing for on that question. Let's see another question from our participants here. And participants, please feel free to continue um, posing your questions uh, in the Q and A, and I will pose them to the um, the panelists. So, uh, one question we have here is um, for, the, for people that apply to the program: um, What do you think helped distinguish your applications um, from others in 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 a very talented um, application pool? I, I don't know because I didn't see the other application, but I would say um, <laughs> I, I come from an arts background. I was a, a degree in humanities. I was studying to be a medievalist in my past life. I was not your kind of, you know, um, prime MBA candidate. Um, if you're looking at kind of when you start reading the articles to prep yourself, I was putting myself in a tizzy. But I would say that probably the biggest thing is just to really be yourself. Um, because and not try and be someone that you think that they want because really what they're minors like what they're looking to do is create a cohort of people that come from all sorts of different backgrounds and, and different ways that you can learn together so trying to stick yourself into a box of something that you read online that is perfect I mean I remember going into my interview and being so nervous because I read somewhere that you have a greater chance if you interview with someone of the opposite sex and I got there and the guy I was supposed to interview with couldn't do it. So I was interviewing with a woman and it said not to play with your hair. And I was just beside myself um, when I relaxed a little bit and we just started chatting. It's just, it just be yourself and know for yourself, like, you know what you have to offer. And if it's not the right thing, then this isn't the right thing for you. And that's like, it's a hard lesson to learn. And you do that with job, you know, job applications and interviews as you kind of, progress in your career you know what they like, know what you're worth and put that forward and if it's not the right thing then maybe it's not the right thing and you you move on and you do something different but um if you just have that confidence and, and put yourself forward that that would be the best way to for me to have you distinguish yourself 
Mm -hmm. Lots of good points there. And I would con like, I want to like support this like thing that we're not trying to trick you up in these interviews. Um, we really just want to get to know who you are. This is programs about fit. We're not trying to trip you up. We just want to get to know you and see if this is the right fit for, you know, what your goals are is, um, you know, is the right fit for what we can offer you in the program. So the last thing we want is someone that is going to do this program and get nothing out of it that's like our worst nightmare so all of these questions and things that we have like even the tests is just to test your readiness to be successful in the program so just know that we're not out there to get you it's really like a pretty easy process and and don't believe all those rumors out there about how difficult this is anybody else want to share their um, application stories and tips Well, I also don't know if I had a really good application or just like got in, um, but I would say reach out to Vivian to have coffee. I think that was really helpful. I did that with you and um, ask questions and, you know, I, I had lots of questions and I don't know what other students are asking you when they come to see you, Vivian, um, but I was really wondering about what the what the class would be made up like and you know how would i fit into that and how many accountants are there in the class and um yeah i don't yeah i don't know if my application was any good i got in but who knows how in <laughs> tomorrow had a very good application but she was very much an accountant because she had she wanted to know all the statistics <laughs> so yeah. i was like rushing around looking for statistics for uh, tomorrow because she needed to know the numbers <laughs> My insistence may have hurt my application. No, it did not. <laughs> we got everyone. <laughs> it's interesting because as um, admissions officers, you get to know people's different personalities. And like, it would it totally made sense that Tamara wanted the numbers. Like, that's how she operates as an accountant. So like, you know, we're used to dealing with people from all different types of backgrounds. So like Tamara asking lots of questions about numbers just made sense because that's her background. So don't, don't worry about asking questions, ask away. That's what we're here for. And um, know that we value people from all different types of backgrounds. Yeah, and Martina, do you have any tips? Um, you have an interesting perspective as both like, um, you know, an MBA grad, but also you, we, we also assess people's career journeys or career intentions in, in the application process. So I wonder if Martina, you want to share some about like, some tips on like kind of career journeys or thinking about career pre MBA before you make this kind of decision. Yeah, it's a, yeah, that's a very good comment. I would agree with Rebecca when it comes to the application. Um, I think that um, knowing who you are a little bit and, and what's your personal story and what's your pitch and, um, you know, what do you bring to the table? Um, it's more, it, it's the, probably the most important piece because that's also what the employers are looking for. They really want to know, um, you know, uh, what do you bring to the table? Because they're looking for not only diversity in terms of gender, but they're also looking for diversity in thinking, in your experience, because every good leader and manager knows that um, if you have a team of yaysayers who have the same profile, you're never going to have any innovation or you're never going to really move the needle on anything. So um, I think that, um, and, and I certainly experienced that as a, as a student, diversity and, and, and really cohort full of character and uh, people with different experiences is the best thing that, that can happen, right? So, um, and, and we kind of um, guide students towards that also when they work with us um, and when they work with the career coaches. I mean, there is, um, and I cannot tell you how many times, um, you know, we are having that conversation about people's personal pitch and, and knowing what their stories are and, and you know, being authentic about what, what they want and, um, you know, and how to present themselves. So um, I think that that's, that's really important part um, of the application. And, and um, I mean, I applied to, I think, to three Canadian schools when I was applying and, and I was very fortunate to get into all of them. But for example, I chose Sorter because the, of the cohort. I actually went and sat um, in all of the, I think I sat in classes in about seven Canadian schools. I was very thorough with my research. And um, what I really like about Sorter was that, um, you know, the people were speaking to each other. You know, when I was sitting in the class, the people were coming up to me. It wasn't this huge cohort of 400, um, what I experienced, for example, in Rotman. Um, so it was really kind of like, even from that moment of recruitment, it was, it, it looked like a fairly tight knit community. So, um, and that was definitely what I was looking for. I wasn't looking to be, you know, this 
this anonymous person in a bunch of 800 MBAs. Um, I really wanted to get to know people um, because I'm a very relationship-based person. And if people are looking for the tight-knit community and, um, you know, very collaborative environment, I found that some of the MBA programs that I checked out were very competitive and cutthroat. And I don't know about, um, you know, um, the rest of the girls, but um, I did not experience that in my cohort. We were actually very supportive of each other. And that was a big plus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that, Martina. Um, so I do have a question. It came up during one of our previous um, alumni panels. This idea that, um, you know, when you do an MBA, that you're actually signaling to your employer, to the world, that you are ready for the next step in your career. I, I want to build a kind of a conversation around that because I thought that was a really interesting concept. Like when you do an MBA, it's not just apparent to, you know, your employer because, you know, you're, you're doing this MBA part time, hopefully you have the blessings, but also, you know, you put that on your LinkedIn and it's kind of signaling that you're ready for, um, you know, the next step in your career. Do you guys have any thoughts around this idea that when you make the decision to do an MBA that you're actually signaling like to, you know, the business world, like whether it's your own employer or the outside world that you are ready for that leadership shift? I think that there's there's probably some some truth to that. I think that there, um, for me, it, it's a little bit cautionary because it's not enough, right? Even just doing the MBA isn't enough. It's not, you know, and it's not enough to just get the the letters after your name. It's really about what you do with it and what you do with the learning um, and how you apply that. So, I would say, almost anyone can learn anything. Um, you know, we, we all have the ability, but it's really how you apply it and what you do with it. So, well, yes, it can signal. It's, it's not enough to rely on that as the signal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's not just about like three letters after your name, of course, right? Um, it's about absolutely what you do with it. Um, and, and like how you plan to utilize what you learn from the MBA as well and the connections that you can make. But, um, but definitely, like, there is a little bit of a signaling happening there, but um, definitely it's what you do with it that matters. Yeah, um, myself doing an MBA was definitely a signal to myself. I wanted to change very badly. I've been doing the same career for almost 10 years, and I, although I really liked it, I wanted to, I'm a major learner, so I really wanted to learn other things. Um, but career changing, not the MBA, the MBA was very manageable. Career changing was by far the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm. And uh, like Rebecca says, the MBA, a do not get you the job you really have to hustle um, and as someone who um, didn't have a clear vision coming out of the MBA I felt um, and that's not a product of the MBA I just felt very empowered by the MBA I learned some amazing skills I really learned how to collaborate with people and I learned how to think very differently than I did coming out of my other um, career um, so although I had all these great skills I you know it was very difficult to find out you know really what I what did I want to do and and um, that kind of is reflected in the career story I told earlier so it's a lot of work, but it's very, very worth it. Um, and you, you know, you still have to, you still have to hustle and you still have to prove it. Um, and as a woman, I think it's also difficult. Um, my two experiences prior to UBC were uh, complex. Um, and I had some interesting experiences from being a woman. So it is, uh, it's definitely a challenging road, but the MBA definitely, um, the support network, as well as the skills that you gain um, through the program really do help and support um, the shift. Mm -hmm. If I can add to that, um, I think the most important part of this is to understand what you said, Sarah, is the signal to yourself that you maybe want something more, that you maybe want something different. I actually had an experience because I left a very senior career um, back in Europe. And um, I actually had some of my friends and even some of the people in my professional network saying, Martina, you already have one master's degree. Why on earth are you going and doing an MBA and in a, in a different country? And for the expense that you can buy an apartment like why are you doing all of this so but i knew that it was a signal for me that i wanted to change i wanted something different and if you are really um you know believing in yourself that um this is what can maybe move you forward and is the mba absolutely critical in moving you forward in your career um in some cases yes in some cases not um it just also depends on your individual circumstances and situation um, so, but it, it is important to know why are you doing it and, and, and you know, as, as Sarah said, you might not have a complete clarity, but I think that the MBA can open a lot of horizons. I, what I've seen is, and it was certainly the case for myself, that when you come to the MBA program, you, you probably see the um, tip of the iceberg. 
and all of the opportunities what you think that are out there but you don't see everything that's that's below and just by having all of this knowledge and and connecting with whether it's faculty or alumni or your fellow students like this whole new world opens that i would have probably not had if i you know went to um you know if i continued in my career i probably had a very good career but um it was something very different and i knew that that was the signal to myself that i i won't change so I would just, you know, encourage um, people just to be courageous with themselves. And um, if, if if they're getting this internal signal that something's got to shift, something's got to change, um, MBA can be one of the really great options. Um, but it certainly is an option for people who, who want it. Um, because um, as you've seen from all of the panelists, it's quite a journey. I mean, there is, um, there is a quite a lot of commitment that comes comes with it and and even though it's very rewarding it can be very difficult at times it's, it's not all rainbows and unicorns for sure i i would say but um i mean i i did not regret it that i that i did it not for not for a minute and i know i i have not really heard from people um that i know that done the mba with me that they would regret it either mm -hmm. that's great um, and just to kind of offer my experience with using an MBA as a signal, um, I very much used it as a signal because I had two children before and there's a, there's a considerable gap between my first two and my third. Um, and I had experienced quite a bit of questioning about how many children do you want to have? And can you, you sure you can keep up with, you know, a career with these young kids and, um, I can tell you that no one asked my husband that <laughs> and I saw the MBA as a signal to my network and to my employer that I can pursue my career and have a full experience with a family. That's tremendous. Um, I think that says so much just because I think sometimes your story is written for people like you, you're a mother of three children. Like, what like it's you know that's your story whether you want it or not and like you know even though an mba is what you make of it like what you do what you use with it and how you utilize it you know embarking on such a journey is actually sending us you know this person's actually willing to work hard to to actually you know overcome this label that society has put on them that you know like you can't help like it's as as much as it can anger you or frustrate you like it's like this label that's put on women sometimes when they have like three children like what can you possibly do and like an mba even though it is always what you make of it can be a very useful signal in that way to rewrite your brand and say that i'm not just a mother i'm a mother and i'm an mba graduate and like now you've done so much with your career which is really quite amazing and cathartic thanks for sharing that <laughs> Um, okay, so we're we're coming to the end of the panel session. So, um, you know, that was a really lovely point to end on. But I, I'll just ask if um, you know if the panels have any last parting thoughts to share with our um, our participants. You know, any tips they have, like a, any tips related to like how you do this with a busy life schedule and 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 family obligations or anything. It could be related to anything. But your number one biggest tip for people that are considering this journey. Um, for, for me, I would say there's no perfect time. Um, so don't wait for that. Uh, similar to Tamara getting her uh, acceptance at, at the hospital, I um, got accepted into the program and found I was pregnant in the same week. And I would just was like, well, we got to do this because I've been waiting for both of these things and they're both happening. So yeah, there's always going to be something that might potentially hold you back. So if it's something you want to do, just lean into that discomfort and you'll figure it out. And the program is like UBC and Sauter is super um, helpful and flexible in, in helping you navigate that um, and navigate, especially in the part-time program, life happens, work happens, there's things that go on. And the, the program has always been super supportive of how to help you navigate that so that you can have your career and your family and the pro and the MBA at the same time. So I'd say lean in and, and yeah, it's uncomfortable, but do it. You won't regret it. <laughs> awesome. Anybody else? Last piece of advice. I, I can go next. Um, it's actually, I've been doing a lot of research around all of this and, and leadership and, and MBA. And 
you know, I would like to kind of appeal to um, women's courage. Um, and because when, when we look at the big picture, you know, even maybe we have globally about 38% of women in MBA programs, but um, when you look at the Fortune 500 companies, there is only, you know, 37 women who are leading those 500 Fortune companies. That's like 7.5% for um, Tamara as, as the numbers person. Um, and, um, you know, when I looked at um, how many universities, top 200 universities in the world are actually being run by women, it's, it's, it's only about 39 which, which is very, you know, again, very low, well, very low number. So, um, you know, I think that we need to translate that, that women's career and, and, and into a little bit more leadership. Um, you know, we've seen what's happening in the world out there. Um, and I just, I, I, you know, who are some of the best leaders out there right now and, and, and who is really leading by example and giving us some really good stuff that's happening in the world. And, and I dare say that a lot of those are women, actually. Um, please be courageous, you know, um, start an MBA or, or you know, um, push in your, in your career and, um, you know, en envision those leadership positions for yourself because it, it's a remarkable, some of the systemic changes that we can do if, if we have the courage. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful um, thoughts to, to be shared. And again, like, I mentioned at the very beginning of this um, presentation, just the remarkable leadership of women leaders in the world throughout this COVID crisis, like the eradication of COVID-19 in New Zealand is, is by a woman, it's led by a woman who has a two-year-old at home, which I just find like so incredible, you know? So like they could, you could definitely, you can definitely have this. And, um, and yeah, so that's, that's definitely some great thoughts to impart the courage and just, seeing other women leaders do it and knowing that it is possible even though like you have more odds sometimes like as women stacked against you any other thoughts um oh i'll just say that um you know as you consider this program for yourself it is a very fun two years it is an investment you're going to spend a lot of time with your your cohort learning new things, learning from professors. Um, so I would encourage you to, you know, think about, you know, is this the time that I can invest so much into two years? You'll get so much back um, and it'll, it's, it'll be a very special time for you. Um, so make space for that to be special and, and dedicate the time. And if you need to get support from your partner so that you can go out to a, one of the networking events with your cohort, do it, or, you know, it's, it's a special time. So enjoy it. And Sarah, anything else to add? It's like a last piece of advice. <laughs> um, yeah, I can just say, you know, I get a lot of comments from when I tell my story uh, from people that they couldn't do that. Um, and I think like this panel is a testament that you can do it if you want it. And so, you know, if you want to do this and you want a career change and you want to take on all the complexities and you want to nail it as a woman in a leadership role or in any role, um, just do it. You can, it's absolutely possible if you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Great words from a really extraordinary panel. So I hope this evening it was a great opportunity. I was trying to like make sure that like people could see themselves in this extraordinary panel, like, you know, like their doubts before the program and where they were starting from and hopefully become inspired by their stories. Um, so thank you again. I want to like everyone that's watching to give a big virtual round of applause to, to everyone that's um, here on this panel. Um, thank you so much to everyone for, um, you know, sharing your stories, um, helping us being inspired by what you've done. Um, I can say because like I've, I've known some of you kind of like at the beginning of the process as you move through your careers, it's been tremendously rewarding seeing you move through your um, career transformations. I think like I was with Tamara from the very beginning and to like actually see her do like the double transition like within like I don't know before she even finished the program was like superbly rewarding for me and then to know that she was also balancing children and things like that and um, to hear the, that you really do appreciate the support at different stages of your career as well um, makes it tremendously rewarding for me to, to have known you um, through this through your processes as um, student the MBA program and then also to be able to share your stories so thank you again um, for um, sharing your stories and um, I hope to see you in person again soon once uh, once this COVID crisis is is finished I'm sure there's many women leaders around the world that are going to be taking us there to um, to eradication of this um, this disease that we're all facing so thank you again and um, hope to see you again soon <laughs>